Hello, Booktube. I thought we'd continue with my unending library tour. Uh, this is the uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. The, this is bookshelf number six of the Middle West Wall bookcase. Uh, and I'm we're getting close to the floor, <laughs> so that's well, that's why the weird camera angle here. Uh, and we'll once again start with the transverse books, the ones that I put on top, uh, just so we can we have room to maneuver. The first one of those is this thing, which I think we've seen on this channel before. It's something I found used, Peterson's Owls, just the, the Roger Torrey Peterson guide to uh, owls, the usual uh, nature guide thing. But I love I love going through these, and it's the best one that I've found, the best owl guide that I've found, uh, even better than some of the far bigger and more comprehensive ones. Uh, and then this thing here, this is an old uh, Venice book. Tons of uh, high-definition black-and-white photos. This is from uh, 1957. <laughs> that explains why I have it. Uh, it's a very simple maroon thing. The, the real glory is all the artwork on the inside. Uh, those of you who might be new to this, see it has a fold-out map of the city. Those of you who might be new to the channel, I... I uh, We'll, we'll soon learn, because <laughs> I never shut up about it, of my uh, unending love affair with the city of Venice. I lived there uh, for a chunk of time, and uh, I love it more than any place on earth, with only one exception. <laughs> so so I, I, when I find, you know, a, a dirt cheap or free book, especially something archival like this, I, I grab it. And then the last, the archive, uh, the transverse books, is this skinny little thing by Anna Quinlan, Good Dog, Stay. Uh, which I, I, it's a, uh, it's just about loving dogs. It's, it's not anything I'm going to talk about at length right now, but, uh, I really like it. She's really good. Uh, and then the other, the other thing that is on the transverse shelf is not a book, but it actually gives insight into what I do with books. Uh, it's this. It's from a very recent issue of the TLS, the Times Literary Supplement, and it is their review of uh, the Dennis Washburn translation of The Tale of Genji, the, the Murasaki Shikibu's 1,000-year-old novel that I dearly, dearly love. Uh, and this is uh, what I do now. I used to have a filing cabinet, an actual metal filing cabinet full of stuff, and that got whittled down to a couple of those plastic filing cabinet thingies with the, with the you know, the, the rows on the inside, and those were full. And I would lug them around from room to room, from apartment to apartment. And then finally, a few years ago, I realized that I don't ever go back to them. I don't ever look at them, at their, their contents. So I went through them like crap through a goose. <laughs> Got rid of, probably, it's not an exaggeration to say 99% of what was in those files. And a huge number of them were old book reviews that I really enjoyed reading and pulled out of their original ma magazines or newspapers in order to keep. And that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so, uh, if I'm not going to consult them, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, and I, then I realized, this was a couple of years ago, I realized that the, the ones that I do consult, the ones that I actually like having, are the ones that I fold up and put in their book, <laughs> that I put inside their respective book. I like finding those more than anything else in used bookstores, and I like encountering those in my own books when I go through them. So that's what I did. I went through all the book reviews that were in those filing cabinets. I got rid of everything that was of no interest, and all the stuff that pertained to books that I actually own, I, I cleaned up and trimmed and folded and put in those books <laughs> uh, so that I don't have any need for it. And that that formed a new habit. Now that is what I do. So when I'm finished with a week's worth of reading, I pull out the book reviews that I really liked that are directly connected to books that I actually own. And then I fold them and I put them in the book. And I think I put this one, I put this one on, the, on the shelf here just because I didn't feel at the time like taking the shelf apart in order to put it uh, in its home. But now that we're here <laughs> and I'm taking the shelf apart anyway, we'll do it together. And of course its home is this. This is the Dennis Washburn translation of Tale of Genji. Uh, so we just put the review <laughs> right in the book. 
Uh, and uh, I really, really like this translation. I, I recommend it very strongly. Uh, I recommend Genji just in general, but it's hard to do. I mean, look at the size of it. It's gigantic. And it's a thousand years long, or a thousand years old, and it's it's a deeply detailed portrait of a world that has vanished completely. Even the faintest echoes of it have vanished completely. So it's a tough sell. <laughs> uh, I believe that if you tried it, you would fall under its spell. Uh, and I will, if I remember, I will put a link down below to my review of this translation. Uh, and uh, the next book is an actual account, a study of the people over those thousand years that have fallen under Genji's spell and all the different ways they've done it. This is called Reading the Tale of Genji. Uh, I don't know how well you can see that. The lighting is a little tricky here because of uh, the angle of the camera. And the, the this is Sources from the First Millennium. It's just an anthology of, uh, of articles, of scholarly articles about how and where and when people have read Genji and what they've thought of it. It's not reviews. It's, it's the way the culture has embraced Genji. Uh, and I, I got it, and I think I reviewed it. And if I did, I will try to remember to leave a link down below. And uh, I love it. I keep going back to it and finding new details. It, 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 that in itself is a wonderful story. Uh, and then the next one is uh, a problematic book. <laughs> it, was, it was problematic before there were problematic books. Uh, those of you who are at all interested in uh, the so-called new atheist movement will probably have heard of this book. I don't know if you'll have seen it because not everybody has access to the Brattle Bookshop here in Boston. Uh, it's kind of must-reading, but it's infuriating. And it's this. The Anthropic Cosmological Principle by Barrow and Tipler. Uh, and I think I can give you the gist of what it is about uh, by using their own words. Uh, Man could never come into being in, oh, let's see here. Imagine a universe in which one or another of the fundamental dimensionless constants of physics is altered by a few percent one way or the other. Man could never come into being in such a universe that is the central point of the anthropic principle. According to this principle, a life-giving factor lies at the center of the whole machinery and design of the world. And they go on to try and demonstrate it with the strong electromagnetic force, the weak electromagnetic force, the, the forces of gravitation, the, the narrow parameters of visible light or heat or the cosmic background radiation and... Uh, you can see, you can hear in that excerpt right away, uh, the leading assumptions that they use. What, what is it? The whole machinery and design of the world presupposes the world is designed, and and they take it from there. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. It's beautifully written, um, extremely literate and erudite, uh, and insane, <laughs> absolutely insane. It, it ascribes causality to chance. To, to to random chance. It, it, the fact that human beings are around to examine and talk about the universe does not at all mean that the universe was created to create them. That it, <laughs> 99.999% of the universe would kill a human being in a fraction of a second. 99.999% of it has no breathable, no atmosphere at all. The tiny percent that does, it's unbreathable by humans. The, most of the the biome of Earth is uninhabitable by humans. <laughs> so I I always well, the first time I read this, I, I I sat back in awe at the the sheer amount of scholarship involved, and then I started to think about what these two authors were implying, what the import of their work was. This was a long, long time ago, long before uh, there were any new atheists, long before the selfish gene or anything like that. And I remember thinking. On a hot summer day in Boston here, I remember thinking, God almighty, this is an endless amount of trouble that I have just read. <laughs> and another thought that came to my mind quickly, there was, there was a time once, far, far in the, in the, the north of, uh, of, of Canada, far uninhabited north of Canada, up by, this, up the, by the Arctic Circle, where uh, I slipped. I was hiking in the middle of nowhere. I had dogs. And nobody else. I was 80 million miles away from anything. And I slipped and dunked my leg up to my hip in freezing cold water. And I had to take 
my pants off to dry them. And uh, I had dogs, so I was okay. But I remember thinking, uh, it, it, if you put any weight in the, co in the anthropic cosmological principle, then go to McMurdo Sound in Antarctica. Step off your, your snowmobile, walk 30 paces, and take your clothes off. <laughs> and see what happens. <laughs> and that's in, on your home world. That, that's in, the, uh, the, the, in, in any other world in this solar system, which is an extremely habitable solar system. Any other world in this solar system, you wouldn't get even one step, let alone 30. <laughs> and the rest of the universe? <laughs> anyway, uh, it's a fascinating, fascinating book. Couldn't, couldn't, even though I disagree with everything, or almost everything on every page of it, I couldn't dream of being without it. And I do go back to it. Uh, and then the next book, uh, we'll, we'll this, we're back to this theme. This is Venice. This is John Julius Norris. This is his gigantic uh, history of Venice. Just a, uh, it's just another uh, uh, potted history of the city. You see thousands of them. I just, I tend to like this one more. I, he is, he is an extremely engaging uh, historian. No matter what he writes about. And so I, I have this. And I have it in the big Penguin paperback instead of the rather non... The slightly more nondescript hardcover. I just... If I'm going to have a choice for something that I'm only going to reread once every couple of years, I want the Penguin on the spine. <laughs> uh, the next one is something... We've seen its kind on this channel before, although I think this may be my favorite example. Uh, these picture books of British homes. And British churches and that sort of thing. And this, that's what this is. This is England's Best Thousand Houses by Simon Jenkins. And he goes through uh, the ages and through every part of England and comes up with 1,000 houses from uh, spanning a 1,000 years that, are, that give insight into their time, that breathe a certain character. I look at this thing all the time. I had a big, fat trade paperback of it originally that I got at the bookstore when I worked there. And I read the thing until it was falling apart. It had rubber bands all over it. And I, then I found this thing, uh, you know, a nice durable hardcover at the Brattle Bookshop and I grabbed it right away. Uh, then the next one is something that you will know <laughs> very seldom. It, it's it comparatively seldom what happens on this channel when I hold up a work of history that everybody knows. But I think everybody will probably know this one. It's The Heart of the Sea by Nathaniel Philbrick. Uh, this is his story of the whale ship Essex that was stove by a whale and sunk. <laughs> uh, and then it was made into a movie just recently. Uh, and uh, it's a it's a heck of a story. He just does a fantastic job with it. Uh, as I, I used to sell the Dickens out of it at the bookstore. Um, the And as I would tell my customers, the only objection that I have to it is that uh, Philbrick a couple of times seems to put credence by the fact that the Essex was attacked because the whale mistook it for another whale. <laughs> <laughs> and no credence should be put on, on such a crazy theory. <laughs> I think it has a brain the size of a Volkswagen. I think it can tell a ship made of wood from another whale. <laughs> anyway, uh, and then we have a classic of, uh, of science nature writing. A classic that you all should read. Not, you should, you, if you're the least bit interested in the subject, it's must reading. And it's The Dinosaur Heresies by Robert Backer. This is the, the book in which he famously popularizes the idea that dinosaurs were warm-blooded and that they their living descendants today are birds. Uh, and it, it's it's got illustrations all throughout, quite a few of which by, are by our author. And it's also got his signature blend of scientific humor and, you know, non-paradigmatic thinking. Just, <laughs> just it's, a, it's a dinosaur book that does not bore which, you know, a surprising number of them do. <laughs> uh, and then another big uh, study. This one is is tougher. It's a very, very deep book. I love it. I absolutely love it. It is endless. It's Africa by John Reeder. Uh, and it's, it's. I had the, there's a crappy trade paperback that I, I had forever and ever. I got the hardcover originally and then got rid of it for some unknown reason. And then I had this crappy trade paperback. And I remember... It was bothering me and bothering me. I was coping, hoping I would find the hardcover at the Brattle, and I never quite did. And then one time I was visiting a friend of mine in New York, just a few years ago. In fact, it was the last trip that I took to New York before uh, my dogs became too sick for me to really 
justify leaving them for, for long periods of time. Uh, it was the last trip to New York. And I, I, I went uh, with a friend of mine. I went to the Strand Bookshop. Some of you will know that it's a great used bookstore in Manhattan. And they have outdoor bargain carts like the Brattle Bookshop here in Boston. They're only a tiny shadow of the Brattle's dollar carts. But they still are out there. And I would go out there and I, I was poking around. And in the back of my head I was thinking, yeah, I sure hope I find Africa by John Reeder. <laughs> and then I didn't, of course. And we went inside and something snapped inside my head. I realized, wait a minute. <laughs> You're not an undergraduate anymore. You can just go to a shelf, go to the Africa section of the Strand and buy the thing in hardcover. And I did. <laughs> and of course, just the other day, I saw this exact hardcover copy for $3 at the Brattle and I didn't get it because I have it already. But I've read it since then. So <laughs> uh, every once in a while, I indulge myself. <laughs> and then the last book, last book for this shelf uh, is... An example of the kind of thing that we've seen uh, a lot of times, not only in my library tours, but on this channel just in general. Uh, a classic that I love, but the reason I have it is because it's uh, it's of the edition, because it's it's illustrated and nicely presented. Because you can get, I can get these classics for free in a nice clean digital copy at Project Gutenberg and have it on my phone all the time. <laughs> so, so I feel like reading another chapter of it, I can just Read it right away, right there, no matter when, uh, no matter what. <laughs> uh, but this this is uh, Dracula, which is one of my favorite novels. It's, by, it's illustrated by Greg Hildebrandt, who does not only black and white illustrations, but also uh, color. Let me see. If... He's a very, very melodramatic color. Uh, yeah, there's, there's fuzzy old Dracula, a man handling one of his human tormentors. Uh, he... Uh, some of you will know his artwork, him and his brother, uh, for uh, their interpretation of Lord of the Rings, which was, until Peter Jackson, was probably the most, the most uh, widespread and influential visual interpretation of Lord of the Rings. Uh, and then there's our young lovers in the sunlight. Uh, and uh, the reason I have it and the reason I go back and reread it, and I, actually this is this one is kind of starting to feel the wear and tear from all the uh, unconscionable number of times that I reread Dracula, so that I'm actually starting to wonder if I maybe need to start looking for another copy of this. I do see them. Uh, but that's the reason it's here. Not because I don't have many other editions of Dracula, but because I really like this one. I really, when it's a classic, I really like the whole experience. I like the, the care that went into making it. Uh, and that's it. That is the, uh, what did we say this was? One, two, three, four, five, six. That is bookshelf number six of the Middle West Wall bookcase, which leaves only one bookshelf to go. <laughs> and then we'll, be, we'll have knocked off another bookcase <laughs> here in this little book room of mine. Uh, so I'll wrap this up for now, and, uh, and I'll see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.